Hello, and welcome to No Favour for Pioneers, the Edinburgh Medical Heritage Podcast. Today, I'm talking with Janet Phil, author of the book Burke Now and Then. So, Janet, welcome. So, you've got um, quite an interest in the history of body supply. Yes, yes, I guess, I guess so. It started at the Anatomical Museum in the university, where uh, that falls under my remit of my job, but I also volunteer there where it's open. And we have there the skeleton of William Burke. So lots of people, uh, a surprising number of people actually travel quite a distance to see that skeleton. And yet quite a few of them had some very dodgy stories that actually went with it that didn't bear a lot of relationship to the truth. So that was uh, what spurred my interest in the first point to find out about it. What um, stories were people telling you that weren't true? Oh, well, the, the most common one is that they were grave robbers. That is the one that is perpetrated everywhere. You see it on the BBC, in fact, that Burke and Hare dug up graves to supply the anatomists of the time. And you can see where that confusion came from, because there were a lot of people who were doing that. What were they? Uh, they were serial killers. Uh, up until oh. recently, they were the UK's most successful serial killers, if successful is, is a, a good term to use. Uh, their first victim, they just happened to die in the boarding house that was run by Hare's wife. They tried to take it to the university, but fortunately, the university lecturers had left for the day, and a student redirected them to Robert Knox, who gave them sort of close to £7 for that body, and that they realised that this was a very easy way of getting money. I suppose people know that Burke and Hare were involved in it, and they might know Robert Knox as well. But was Hare's wife involved as well? She, she wasn't found guilty, but I mean, she wasn't found guilty because her husband turned King's evidence and you can't, can't give testimony against your spouse. But she was almost certainly involved. She must have known about it. And in fact, the story is that she lured several of the people back to the house to be murdered. It, it's kind of implausible that the two wives didn't know what was going on. And so how many people ended up murdered because of Burke and Hare? 16. It, it, it's confusing because he says 16. Uh, he was challenged in, in prison when obviously lots of people were interviewing him that it was actually more and he absolutely said it wasn't anymore. It was just the 16. Uh, but he was only convicted for one murder. So you don't have to convict people for multiple murders when you have capital punishment. Whose murder was he convicted of? Was it the last it was. It, it was the last one. It was an interest. I mean, the Burke and Hare case has it sort of has connotations for, for medicine and anatomy, but actually there's, le there's important legal decisions that were made during the case as well. Uh, so he was convicted for the last one because they still had the body of Maggie Doherty. So obviously all the other bodies had been destroyed, so there wasn't any evidence. So they still had that body. And when the lawyers put the case together, that was the only case in which they also named Burke's wife as an accomplice. So they were both being tried for murder. Hare had provided them with evidence when he turned King's evidence. So he had provided them with information about three murders. Um, the last one, Maggie Doherty, Daft Jamie, and also Mary Patterson. Um, but those two bodies had disappeared. Burke's wife wasn't mentioned in the murder of those other two people. They, they wanted to try all three murders together. Uh, and there was a big, long legal discussion which eventually said they couldn't. Um, and they had to pick which case they were going to go for first. So they went for the last case because of the evidence and the fact it involved Burke's wife. Obviously, if they failed to get a guilty verdict on that one, they would have moved to the next one. But yeah, back when we had capital punishment, you only needed one guilty verdict. And when you say turns King's evidence, you mean Hare essentially gave up Burke in order to get immunity? Absolutely. I mean, Burke and Hare have been quite clever about it. There were no witnesses to any of the murders. Um, so as long as the two of them stayed quiet, it was going to be very hard to get any evidence at all. And so they offered Hare the option of confessing and he and his wife would get off scot-free. Great debate as to why they went for Hare rather than Burke. It's not often realised that there was actually quite a difference in their age. So Burke was 36 and strangely enough for that time he could read and write. So his name is signed into the prison papers whereas uh, Hare just made a cross beside his name. Um, and Hare was only 21. 21 when he went to prison. So he was actually only 19 when they started killing people. Oh, so very, very young. Very young and I think the assumption was the older man had led him astray. So why was it so lucrative to sell to Robert Knox, an anatomist of all people? 
if we go back to the sort of 17th century teaching of anatomy in Edinburgh, there were quite a lot of competing anatomy schools. And the university at that time weren't very good at teaching anatomy. Um, so they had had Munro Primus, who was absolutely fantastic. Um, his son was equally good, but by the time we got to Munro Tertius, um, which was you know, Primus's grandson, he, he was just reading his grandfather's notes, which included making jokes about things that happened before he was even alive. The students w were not inspired. And so because they had to learn anatomy, they were looking at these schools outside. Um, and Robert Knox ran one of these extracurricular schools. And so there was competition between these schools. It was quite a lucrative business back then because students paid to attend and the money went directly to the lecturer. And so Knox could get more people to his lectures. And we're talking sort of 400, 500 people if he said he could get fresh bodies because back then Edinburgh Council supplied the university with, well, to start with they supplied them with one body a year for dissection and when the Murder Act came in in 1752 that went up to they got the bodies of all of the people who were executed for murder but that still wasn't very many bodies a year whereas if Knox said come to my lectures and I will have fresh bodies that was quite a crowd puller uh, and so Knox was prepared to pay quite a lot of money I mean, it's horrendous that Burke and Hare killed 16 people and supplied him with 17 bodies. But if you do the maths on how many lectures Knox gave, that is less than 10% of the bodies that he used in a year. So you do have to ask yourself where the other 90% came from. Do we know where the other 90% came from? Uh, they probably came from grave robbing. There's quite a lot of, of grave robbing teams in Edinburgh that went out as far as last wade to dig up recently buried people and sold them to Knox. There was quite a lot of rival gangs. So how did one get into grave robbing in Edinburgh? Yeah, I'm going to say you were probably fairly desperate and it was easy money. If you ran a boarding house and somebody in your house died and they had no relatives and the body wasn't claimed, there was nothing wrong with you selling it to the anatomists. That was considered normal. Grave robbing wasn't actually a crime. So the, the worst that was going to happen was you might, it was a misdemeanor, so you might have a fine. But if you were working for, for someone like Knox, if you were fined, he would probably pay it for you. I guess it was fairly lucrative money if you weren't caught. You dug up a fairly, fairly fresh grave, so it would have been hard work digging it up. But you only dug up a hole at the head end, and then they put ropes down and pulled the body out. And so long as you put back, I mean, if you took the clothes with the body, then you had committed a crime. But as long as you took the clothes put them back into the grave, covered it up. That body would get you sort of nine months salary. And you mentioned that there were rival gangs of people. Yeah, rival gangs, which is where we get the difference between grave robbing and body snatching. So grave robbing, you would have actually dug up the body. Body snatching, you would have stole it off the person who had dug it up. Do you know any of the names of the gangs or were they just groups of people who came together uh, through circumstance? They would have been groups of people and returning soldiers from various wars that couldn't find um, employment elsewhere. But the, the big one was Andrew Merrilees. He had almost like a consortium of, of various gangs that went out that answered to him. And he supplied the anatomists through various gang supply chains of people who supplied him with bodies. Was he quite a renowned figure in Edinburgh? I imagine if one body gets you nine months salary, then he must have been quite wealthy. He was, and he was quite, he didn't hide what he did. They were, they were known as resurrectionists. I mean, people didn't enjoy hanging out with them, as it were, but it was a known thing that this happened. That is why we get sort of big iron cages that go over graves, because you only have to protect the grave for three or four days and it becomes useless to the anatomists. So you would get people who sat and went into the watchtowers in graveyards and they watched over graves for the three days after their relatives were killed or after their relatives died. Or we even have death houses in some of the graveyards, which is a big stone house where the coffins were left for four days before they were buried. So which was the more common way of trying to protect the graves? Was it these death houses, watchtowers or the iron gate? Uh, we've got a mixture in Scotland. The, the, the iron gate was the preferred way, sort of an iron cage that goes over it because you rented it from the graveyard and they put it over the grave for a, a week and then rented it to the next person. So that was obviously something they encouraged on a commercial front for people to do. But you can see there's, there's devices that used to have shotguns wired up to wires around the grave so that if the wire was triggered, the shotgun fired at whoever was interfering with the grave. There were some quite inventive ways of protecting graves.
There were at least 16 murders by Burke and Hare. What time course did this take place over? Was it a matter of days, weeks, months? Uh, months. The last one was on October the 31st, because it was a Halloween party, in 1828. And the first one was just before Christmas in 1827. Burke's confession only has one exact date in it. The rest of them are sort of roughly over the over the space of 12 to 18 months they killed 16 people halloween was that a very popular time burke and hare are irish and apparently it is a bigger it was a bigger thing back then for irish community to celebrate um and the last victim was also irish so they persuaded her to come back to the house because they were going to have drinks that night so you mentioned um maggie doherty yeah what sort of people were the victims Interestingly, the papers at the time tried to portray most of them as being prostitutes, which wasn't the case. Famously, Mary Patterson, there was quite a lot of publicity around her death, um, mainly because Knox got an artist in to draw the dead body, which is a bit weird. And he also preserved it for three months, which is also a bit weird. But she was portrayed in the papers as, as being a prostitute. But there's, a, there's an academic in America called Lisa Rosner who's done quite a lot of research into Mary Patterson and um, her friend at the time protested that she was being described as a prostitute and, and she, there's no evidence that she was it was just the papers at the time a bit like the papers now so there, there were women they tended to be people who no one was going to miss so people who'd come into town and were going to leave town in the next few days they they were predominantly women but there were men in there um, they were lodgers in Hare's lodging house so travelers that yeah, like I say, no one would miss. There was also one victim that was handed over to Birkenhair by the police, who was a drunken woman that they were taking back back to the police station. And, and Burke had said, oh, I know where she lives. I'll, I'll take her home. They did tend to take most of them out and drink them under the table. Birkenhair are people, they were drinking a quarter of a pint for whiskey for breakfast. Um, so if you went out drinking with Birkenhair, the chances were they would give you a, an awful lot of alcohol and they would probably still be okay. Um, there is debate that some of the victims would never have woken up even if they hadn't actually killed them because they'd managed to poison them with sufficient alcohol that they weren't going to recover from that. But they did also kill a 10-year-old boy in that collection of people as well. And um, I guess, you know, from Burke's point of view and his confession, it started to go wrong when they killed people that would be missed. So Daft Jamie was a celebrated figure on the Royal Mile. People knew him. He had a club foot. He was distinctive. When he was dissected at, at Knox's place, his feet were removed, which adds to the belief that Knox knew what was going on and people would have recognised him. So it was a collection of people, but people that wouldn't be missed, but equally people that they could subdue with drink or just overpower. The two of them worked on the canal. They were fairly physical people, so um, they could overpower most people. So very likely they would have died from alcohol poisoning anyway. But yep. how did Burke and Hare make sure that the job was done? Well, they killed them in a, a clever way, which we actually now call burking, which arguably should be called herring, but you know. So they held the mouth shut with their fingers and then pinched the nose with the, with the sort of index finger and thumb. of. So they, they essentially closed off both airways. And then apparently the other person laid over their chest so they couldn't struggle. But most of them were unconscious from drink anyway. But they couldn't struggle. And also, obviously, it's harder to breathe in if somebody's laying across your chest. There was a belief, because it was around about the same time other people were also killing people for, for body supply, with pitch bandages. So these were sort of squares of, of a material that they covered in pitch, like tar, and then pressed over the mouth and the nose. That, that wasn't Birkin hair. It's another one of these uh, myths that's perpetrated about them. So of the 16, 15 of them were killed by the method called burking. One of them was suffocated with a cushion. So there were other people killing to provide bodies as well? Yeah, a lot of people said the Anatomy Act came in as a result of Burke and Hare, but, but it didn't. It came in as a result of some guys down in London um, who were killing to supply the London medical schools. Now, interestingly, they were caught over a case that was called the Italian Boy, where a little Italian boy who had been selling mice on a street corner disappeared. And their whole court case led up to the fact that they had um, drugged this kid with laudanum, and then they hung their victims upside down in a well to drown them. Uh, they were found guilty, and they were killed. And before they were executed, they confessed to having supplied close to 400 bodies to the London medical schools. 
And the, the twist in the tale is that shortly after they were executed, the Italian kid turned up. So although they were found guilty of killing him, they hadn't. But they then confessed to killing 400 other people. Assumedly, this was going on for a much longer time than Burke and Hare's killings. Yes. Uh, and there's, there's um, reports of bodies being found in cases that came across from Ireland. I mean, every medical school needed hundreds of bodies. So they were actually importing bodies um, from elsewhere. And the questions weren't being asked about a large section of society that just disappeared. Those um, bodies, did they usually come just from Ireland? I think because this is before, before preservation, so there's a time limit on how long the bodies can actually take to get here. Um, so the reports I've seen are mainly, mostly from Ireland. I think you've only got a couple of days to get it to where you're trying to get it to. So Maggie Doherty was the last person to be killed. Yeah. Why was it Maggie and not someone else? Well, well, I guess she, I mean, she was the last one because they got caught. She had come in to town looking for her son who'd stayed somewhere in the Pleasants area of town and he had then gone. So she fitted the, the remit of someone who was coming to town. Nobody knew her. She was about to go. The Halloween party was really the undoing of her. So by this time, Burke and Hare were living in different houses. They had moved out supposedly because... Hare suggested they should kill Burke's wife because Burke's wife was Scottish and the other three were all Irish. And he suggested that they should get rid of um, the Scot because they couldn't be trusted, should just keep it with amongst the Irish people. Burke obviously uh, didn't go along with this and they moved out to, uh, to, to a different house where they were having the Halloween party. Burke had some people that were staying with him at that time. Um, so he had to get rid of those lodgers. And it's a weird concept for us because he had lodgers, but there was only also one room in this house. So any lodgers would have known exactly what was going on. He pushed those lodgers over to Hare's lodging house um, where Hare took them in. But they came back the following day because they'd left their child's socks under the bed in Burke's house. So whilst the woman was searching for, for her kid's socks, she discovered the remains in the straw under the bed. And it, it's, um, it's interesting because they, they then called the police. I mean, they were, when she said she was going to go and call the police, Burke's wife and Hare's wife offered her money to not go to the police, which obviously ties in the fact that the women must have known about it. But they still went to the police. When the police came to Burke's house, they were presented with the fact that the body by this point had gone. The, the lodgers were saying they had seen a body, but when the police spoke to them, these were lodgers that hadn't been paying Burke any rent, and they had been asked to leave his house because he was having a party that he didn't want them at. So the police were thinking that this was all sort of sour grapes, and they were going to leave it. And then they talked to Burke and his wife independently. They had both agreed that Maggie Doherty was at their house, and that she had left at seven. But when they spoke to him independently, it it became apparent that Burke was saying she'd left at seven in the evening and his wife was saying she'd left at seven in the morning. And it's purely because they hadn't tied up their alibi that they got taken in by the police and then the whole thing unravelled. I imagine this is incorrect, but there are a couple of stories about how they were caught in that someone recognised Mary on Knox's anatomy table, but that isn't true. This ties in with the idea, it, it did happen in the paper that she was a prostitute, like I said, and it was published that somebody had recognised her on the table, and that was because doctors make frequent use of prostitutes. That was what the paper wanted to, to, to tie in there. The work that we did on tracking down Mary found that she had been in the Magdalen Asylum in Edinburgh, which is a sort of house for wayward girls, if you like. She had been there for three years, and she had just applied to be released. She was released into Canongate area of town one week before the murder of, of Mary Patterson. And in the, um, in the Magdalen Asylum, you wouldn't have been having any drink. So when she went out drinking with Burke, she, she would have been sober for the last three years. So she was rendered unconscious pretty quick in their drinking session. But you can understand that from having been sober for three years. But we've also got the records from the Royal Infirmary, which show that somebody called Mary Patterson was in with complaints of her liver around about that time as well. Um, and if she had been in the hospital, she would have been seen by the doctors who would have been helping Knox. So although she was recognised, it's perfectly possible she was recognised because she was a patient at the hospital, as opposed to doctors make frequent use of prostitutes. Between Mary Patterson and Maggie Campbell, there's a good four or five other people that die. So the saying somebody recognised Mary Patterson is one of these things that everybody remembered after they were caught. So, so it's like, at the, well, at the time, nobody reported anything. It was only afterwards they said, oh, do you remember? I thought I recognised her. Because everybody's wise once they know all the facts. So from the sounds of um, all of these stories, 
in the end, Hare became the more devious and bloodthirsty one. Yeah, but, but I mean, there are contemporary stories at the time. Again, it, it's one of this, like, once you're in court for something like this, all the people that know you come out of the woodwork. But they went around doing local harvest work to make money before they started murdering people. And there's reports of people who worked on the harvest with them that portray Pear as being a really nasty individual. So the things like they would all put money into a kitty to buy drinks and he would just pocket the lot. And then when somebody questioned him about it, he would be physically assaulted. The impression you get from reading all the books about it is that Hare was the person who probably drove the whole thing. And whilst Burke says he was doing it for the money, even Burke says he's not entirely convinced why Hare was doing it because he's not sure it was for the money. He thinks it was for other motives, the enjoyment of doing it. And he certainly, I guess, you know, turning King's evidence doesn't exactly put you up there as the sort of um, most reliable friend to have. Not at all. So what happened to her after he got immunity? Ah, well, we don't know. Uh, the, what we do know is that there was a big legal discussion because Hare had given them the evidence for three murders. And because they'd found Burke guilty on the first case, they had actually got the evidence for two other murders that they weren't going to use. Um, so at this point, the lawyers asked if they could use that evidence to prosecute Hare. And so big, long legal discussion in, in a debate that still stands to this day. The judges said you can't use it for criminal proceedings, but you can use that evidence for civil proceedings. And so daft Jamie's parents appeared and they took out a court case against Hare for the loss of their son. Now, they obviously weren't very rich people, so there was almost like a sort of GoFundMe in Edinburgh um, to get up the money for the court case. Um, but this was going on whilst Burke was being executed. So when Burke died, Hare was still in prison. So Burke did not know that Hare got off scot-free. But eventually, it was only going to be for money. It wasn't going to be for Hare's life, this court case. And Hare didn't actually have any money because his wife owned the lodging house. And on the day they were arrested, his servant had run off with their pig herd, which was his only other source of income. So it was only going to be for money. He didn't have any money. The money to engage the lawyer soon disappeared. And so the whole court case was thrown out. So Edinburgh Council put Hare into a stagecoach and sent him down towards England okay, under the name of Mr. To black. Now, unfortunately for him, on that night, um, it was raining, so he persuaded his way inside the coach, the stagecoach, and found himself sitting opposite the lawyer who had taken on Darth Jamie's case. So by the time they got to Dumfries, this lawyer had made sure that everybody on the stagecoach knew exactly who this person was. Um, shortly after the stagecoach got there, there was a, a gathering, a mob in Dumfries, and the police had to take him in to the sort of coach house for his own safety. Um, they sneaked him out of a window at the back, and they accompanied him down to the English border, uh, where they released him into England. And that is the last real sighting of Hare. The popular belief is that he was recognised and thrown into a lime pit, which blinded him. Um, and he spent the rest of his days as a blind beggar on the streets of London. But there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, and the popular belief now is that he is buried in a workhouse in Northern Ireland. Kilkenny, I think it is, in Northern Ireland. And that is the popular belief because the doctor at that workhouse, which was a Dr. Reed, he was educated in Edinburgh during the time of the Birkenhead trials. And he says that he recognised Hare in that workhouse. Um, so he's buried over there. And there are several roads around that area that are called like Hare's Corner or whatever, based on that belief. So that's what we think happened to Hare. So is there no record of this Mr. Black Hare's new identity? No, the only record of it is, is Edinburgh Council or somebody in Edinburgh Council saying that he was put on the coach as a pseudonym and that's it. So when they released him into England, he just disappeared. The women equally were, were dark enough after the court case to go back to the house where they both ended up being taken in by the police for their own protection because the mob was um, out to get them. Burke's, Burke's wife ended up, uh, there's records of her going out to Australia and um, Hare's wife went back to Ireland. And so if the mob was so angry at Burke and Hare, was the same anger directed towards Knox? It was. Knox obviously claimed he was completely innocent in all of this, um, and he asked for a public inquiry to prove his innocence. Um, he asked Walter Scott if he would be willing to chair that public inquiry, and Walter Scott turned it down, saying it was clearly going to be a whitewash. He was having nothing to do with it. Um, so it ended up being 
chaired by the Marquis of Queensbury, is that a boxing guy? Yeah. Um, and it, strangely enough, found him completely innocent. Uh, the mob were not convinced about this. They they built an effigy of Knox um, and they took it round to his house in Newington where they broke all the windows. Uh, the plan had apparently been to burn this effigy in the front of his house, um, but nobody brought any matches. So they ended up cutting it up. They did a sort of virtual dissection of his effigy in front of his house. He carried on teaching, but his class numbers dwindled, and so he eventually moved down to London and, and taught down there, and he's buried down in London somewhere. He never got back to the, the height that he was, which is, in a way, he, he was a very good teacher. He was a great anatomist. He was just uh, naive as to where these bodies were coming from. I don't think anybody believes that he didn't know. Was Robert Knox well-connected um, because he was able to ask people like Walter Scott for their help? Robert Knox is portrayed as um, popping jay, is the word that's used. So he would dress up in all his finery, and he would move in those sort of circles, but he didn't suffer falls gladly. Although he was in the sort of back strata of uh, society, he wasn't well-liked because he said what he thought, rather than what was maybe what ought to be said. It's interesting. How did not only the supply of bodies and the extramural schools, how did that all change? Uh, well, we got the 1832 Anatomy Act, which essentially, it allowed the collection of bodies of the unclaimed poor to be given to medical schools, which sounds great until you look into the definition of unclaimed. It also came in with the Poor Act in Victorian Britain. So a lot of people ended up in workhouses because they couldn't find any food or work. Lots of soldiers returning from various wars. So we have these workhouses where families were split up and, and they were forced to work for not very much food, you know, like Oliver Twist sort of thing. To claim somebody who had died in a poor house, you had to have enough money for the burial. And when you entered the poor house, they took all your money that you had off of you. So just because you're unclaimed poor doesn't mean you haven't got tens of relatives in a big family. They just haven't got the money to bury you. So a lot of people that went into the workhouses ended up going for dissection, even though that was not what they wanted. And there was this big um, controversy that what we'd actually done was we'd taken dissection, which used to be a punishment for murderers, and we'd taken it and we'd put it as a punishment on the poor. So big controversy about that. Um, but it did supply the bodies that were needed for medical dissection. In it, there was also the ability to bequest your body. So you could choose to leave your body for medical dissection. And I was actually surprised at some recent research I've been doing for my PhD to discover that that bequeathal of bodies didn't actually supply enough bodies in the UK until 1960. So up until then, we were still using the bodies of unclaimed poor. We obviously don't have poor heads anymore, but unclaimed deaths. People, suicides, people who died in hospitals where people, um, they had nobody to claim that body. They were still being used for dissections up till 1960s. This controversy, it was essentially a legalisation of taking the bodies of the poor. Is that more of a retrospective controversy or one that continued throughout the 19th and early 20th century? It's not so much something we've realised looking, looking back on it. It's not retrospective in that case. People protested at the time. Um, Ruth Richardson has, has got a, written a big book on it on sitting here on my desk, Death, Dissection and the Destitute, which looks at the whole controversy at the time. I was going to say it's always been the case. That's maybe a bit of a sweeping generalisation, but the, I don't want to say rich, but the not poor people tend to agree with dissection more because of the advances they think it gives medicine. But also the people that are dissected tend to be the poorer people in society. So it's the, the rich benefiting from the medical dissection of the poor. That was absolutely the case when it came in in 1832, Victorian Britain. But there's some research and belief that it is still the case now. Because obviously if you donate your body for dissection, you don't have to pay funeral costs. People were more vocal in Victorian Britain, but the poor being vocal in Victorian Britain had very little effect. And so I think it kind of sort of died out, as in nobody listened to the people who were trying to be vocal about it. And gradually as more people, uh, you know, organ donation and those sort of things started, and more and more people started bequeathing their bodies to medicine, the number of unclaimed poor that were needed went down. 
It's interesting, we're talking in a UK context, obviously, um, in other parts of the world, they still use unclaimed poor. So they still use people that are found dead that nobody claims their body. They're still used for medical dissection in other countries. Any countries that we'd be surprised to hear still use unclaimed poor? No, probably not be surprised. They're probably what you would consider to be the less developed countries. But there's still, there's an interesting book called Stiff, The History of the Human Corpse, where they're actually, they've still got people being murdered uh, for the supply of bodies. And that was the 1980s. It, it's documented, I think that was in Colombia, but um, it's a bit like the black trade market in, in organs for transplantation. I'm sure it's still happening somewhere in the world. How did the Birkenhair controversy and the London gang impact the provision of extramural anatomy? I'm imagining with the fall of Grace of Knox, was there a distrust of extramural anatomy schools or was there one that took Knox's place? No, they, can, they tended to decline after that. There were extramural schools, but I think it's sort of by the next century, they've all disappeared. All of the teaching hospitals, all of the medical schools have become associated with hospitals. They're getting their bodies from you know, unclaimed people in the hospital and the poorhouse. They all disappear shortly after the, the anatomy. There's no, there's no competition for bodies anymore. So the medical school can get as many as it, as it needs and the, the extramural schools just disappear. Is that also to do with the fact that the medical school found alternate teaching to Munro Tertius? Well, yes, they appointed Goodfellow in Edinburgh, so yes, they, they improved. Uh, and maybe it's also added to the fact that you no longer inherit your professorial title from your father. Probably had something to do with it as well. In your book, um, Burke, now and then, you talk about how Burke's body tells a story. The first thing is I wouldn't recommend writing a book about a serial killer in the first person. It, it's not a good good ploy. There were times I stopped writing in the middle of it and thought, no, I'll have to just take some time away from this. You don't want to put yourself into that sort of mindset. But I was just astounded by the number. I mean, this, this seems a bit ironic having written a book about a serial killer, but I'm astounded by the fact that people are so interested in that skeleton that we have people come up from Reading when the museum was open to visit the skeleton. People came across from Ireland. In fact, there were a couple that came across from America because they thought they were connected in some way to Burke. I don't, it's the sort of fascination of bad people that people seem to have, which is just so strange. And yet the skeleton hangs there. It's only, I can't remember, it's five foot four. It's, it's pretty small. I would like to think that people have difficulty looking at a skeleton and imagining what the person who um, was molded around that skeleton did. And it, it does seem strange that people travel from so far to see it. But I think that it, it was done in the first person so you could get the viewpoint of that skeleton and they could then remember back what happened. But yeah, it was, it was unusual because obviously nobody had done that. But uh, having done it, I can see why nobody had done it. <laughs> so people came all the way from America. What connections were people claiming when they visited? Uh, those two particular people were claiming they were related to Burke based on... Um, a story that one of, I mean, obviously they had the surname, but one of their relatives had commented on the fact that it was funny that he was a policeman when they had a serial killer in the family. And that appeared to be the only basis they were that they had got. As part of the story, as part of the book, we did look at the family tree of Burke. So we did have a genealogist who was able to sit down with these people and go through the fact that they weren't related to Burke. Um, Although she did find that they were related to somebody who was quite high up in the American Civil War, so, so they were quite happy. But we did also have the frame game, is it, on STV, where people claim they're related to famous people. And they came in and, and did a whole session on somebody who thought they might be related to Burke, which was bizarre because you have to speak to the producers beforehand and go, look, he's not related to Burke. And it's like, no, we'll do the program anyway. And you can reveal that at the end. Yeah, it's strange. We did actually trace Burke's family down to living relatives, which was interesting. Interesting email to write to those people to craft this thing. The, the gene I just did it in sort of ancestry, I think it was, where you can see people tracing their family tree the other way. So we could see that this group of people had traced their family back to the point that we had traced Burke's forwards. And so when we got in touch, it was like joining up two ends. And they were actually able to provide a whole bunch of information that was really interesting because we discovered a niece that nobody had ever mentioned before but we got her immigration papers um, and she had gone from Tyrone so so 
Burke had a brother who worked for the police in America, in Edinburgh, and after the Burke and Hare case, Edinburgh Council had paid his brother to leave town, and they had come from Tyrone in Ireland, and this person had left from Tyrone in Ireland and had gone to um, Australia, and they had the father's name and the mother's name on this immigration certificate, which tied up, so chances are it was this, um, it was the niece of Burke. And she had then gone from Australia across to America on the ships that took the Mormons to Salt Lake City. So as soon as you get into Mormon genealogy, they've got all the records. Um, but the ship was actually shipwrecked on the way there, and there's a whole book about the shipwreck, because the people end up being marooned on the island of Haiti. And there's a big debate over which government should be funding the rescue of these people. Um, but she had been pregnant uh, when she got on the boat. So her baby was the first white person to be born on Haiti. The first white person born there is a relative of William Burke's. But they had kept all the information and we had the um, obituary of the husband when he died and they had traced it all the way down. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I imagine that it's a lot more difficult, but are there any relatives of her around? We didn't look, to be honest, because we're writing a book on Burke. Um, but it, it's really hard to trace Irish relatives anyway, because they had they kept all their records in the one building, which burnt down. Um, so there's a big hole in Irish records. And also there's several, there's several censuses that were taken, which the British government pulped for reasons uh, best known to themselves. Are there any other points that you wanted to talk about? So some things that have come up to me in recent uh, research that I've been doing is the whole issue of body supply for anatomy has a really murky past. And I had always been aware that the anatomists were provided with bodies of, of murdered uh, or of executed murderers. Um, but I come across a paper that was talking about Filippio, Filippi, the person that the um, fallopian tubes are named after, Gabriel Filippio, who was provided with executed criminals, but on one case uh, was just provided with the criminal. The criminal had chosen to be killed by the anatomist rather than the executioner. And so when the supply of bodies came to him, they were alive and, and he had to actually kill them himself, which I don't think is something I had never appreciated as, as anatomists. And other people that have written their books, of it, that, you know, when they used to start the, um, the dissections in Italy, when they first did the big public dissections, they actually, the anatomists dictated when the murderers would be executed so they fitted in with their teaching schedule. So there are some, we, we think of Burke and Hare as being a sort of murky past, but the further back you go, there are some some things that are really, really dubious, yeah. Um, are there any records of um, Flopio reflecting on killing these people? I don't know. We came across a paper that's done by, I think it's Katie Parks. She's a historian that was looking at it. Uh, and, and there was the, the contemplation as to how they were going to do it. They gave him an opium overdose. And there is the reflection of the fact that the first draft didn't kill him. So they had to give him some more or they were going to send him back to be executed. And the guy was begging not to be sent back to be executed. He would rather be killed by the anatomists. So I don't know how they used to execute them, but clearly drinking opiates was a preferable way to go. But no, it'd be interesting. You'd probably think that there wasn't any writings on it because they probably don't want people to know that's what they were doing. With all of these um, anecdotes and all of these um, characters, is there one core moral that you would take from this to give to doctors and medical students and anyone really? I think, and this isn't a unique message, I think you have to be really grateful but also mindful of the people who have chosen to give their bodies for medical dissection now. Particularly now because the people that you're dissecting, it, if you're in the UK, have chosen to do it and realize that maybe most of the stuff that you're learning in your books is based on people who didn't choose to do it. So I think that would be the take home message. Thank you very much. No problem. Mm -hmm.